All right, everybody, welcome to week two of our wealth creation course. We're talking about the truth about retirement plans, part two, how they work. Last week, if you guys just joined us for the first time this week, last week was part one. So we discovered, um, you know, the basics of retirement plans, how they work. Uh, we talked about, you know, custodians and we talked about trustees and we talked about many other things regarding retirement plans. Okay. So this week we're covering really, what do I do if I have one? Right. So if I have a retirement plan, where should I where should I be contributing to if I decide I don't want to use it and and kind of the alternatives, which is very fun for me to talk about because I used to be a big retirement plan guy. OK, so for those of you that are watching, if this is the first time you're tuning in, my name is Jerry Feta. I'm the owner and CEO of a company called Wealth Dynamics, and uh, I've been doing a free financial course every single week for the last three years, every Friday never fails. Okay. And the reason behind that is for me, financial education really matters. Okay. It's not something I was ever taught. It's not something most people are ever taught. And so it's kind of one of those things where I started learning about finances and I realized how, how difficult it really was, right? Like some of the stuff, it's kind of just like, who, who knew, like I never would have guessed some of the things that I ended up learning about finances. And so I share this course because I want it to be easier for you guys. Okay. So if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, if you're on zoom, if you're on YouTube, if you're on my email, uh, email list, wherever you're watching this, this video today, um, I want you to realize that, that money does not have to be complicated. And it's something that all of us can and should be able to understand. Okay. Anytime it seems like it's not that way, it's because there's, there's some kind of a myth, a myth involved or an untruth involved. Okay. So that's kind of the stable thing I want you to operate with. Now, again, the purpose of this course is financial education. So like I said, finances are not supposed to be complicated. So if it ever feels complicated for you at any point tonight, I want you to let me know so that we can stop and answer questions. So if I use words that you don't understand, um, if I start going over your head with different topics, um, I want you guys to stop me and let me know so that I can kind of pause break things down, simplify them, and then we can move forward from there. Because what I, what I used to have happen to me is I was eager to learn about money, right? I was interested in it. I was well-intentioned. Like if I was a student, I was a good student and I wanted to learn about it. But what happened is people would use these words and phrases. It would go over my head. I would then feel like a dumbass, and then I'd be embarrassed and then not say anything because I didn't want to admit that I didn't know because I thought everyone else knew and I was the only one that didn't. Okay. Who's ever felt that way, whether it's in school or, or wherever, like it's, it's kind of this, it's only me feeling right now. What I later learned, especially being a, a wealth advisor, a wealth coach, a CEO of a financial company for almost 10 years now, nobody knows about finances. Okay. So if you don't know, probably everyone else on the stream is wondering the same thing and they're afraid to ask also. So Point being, brave up. If you have a question, ask it because it's going to help everyone a lot because they're all probably wondering the same thing. Um, second thing, we will answer questions. So leave them in the comments. As usual, if you're on Zoom, we will go live at the end of this. So I'll call you on, on the, or I'll get you on the live stream. We'll go live on the air and talk about your questions. And then thirdly, be respectful. Um, I never have to deal with disrespectful comments on Facebook or Zoom. It's always Instagram. So my rule is with Instagram, if you're disrespectful, I'm just going to ignore you. And if it's, if it's bad enough, I'm going to troll you back just as bad. Okay. So don't provoke me because I can be pretty, pretty good with my trolling. So um, guys, without further ado, I want to get into our course here tonight. Now, again, the topic is retirement accounts. And I want to go over a little bit that we're going to be um, covering in my book. So as we're talking, I'm going to be reading some segments from this book that I wrote. This was a book I wrote uh, about three years ago. Okay. And it's called How to Create Wealth right? Now it's very simple. It's very short, but it's very profound because I took all of the stuff that matters. We don't need to know everything there is to know about everything there is about money. We need to know what's going to work and what matters for what I'm trying to do, right? Like what, what, what's the main thing? We don't need all of the, all of the haystack. We just need the needles we're looking for. So I'm going to be reading from my book, how to create wealth by Jerry Feta. Again, that is me. Um, if you guys are, are interested in getting this book, you can go to jerryfeta.com and I'll get you a free copy on the website. If you have a copy of it, we are going to be on the paperback version. It's going to be page 46. Okay. So if you have the book, you can jump on and you can follow along with us as well. All right. Now, um, again, if you guys are watching this, one other thing I want to do that's new here is we have uh, Nano Aquino. He's one of my, my teammates here. Um, he's on the stream on Zoom. So Nano will be re re reaching out to you with, um, you know, 
maybe questions, things he thinks you might want to be able to get help with. So if you're on this and Nano sends you a message, be sure to check your chat. Um, Nano will get in touch with you. He'll be able to answer your questions. If during this, you're like, hey, I want to set up a call with these guys and learn more about maybe how this applies to my situation, Nano is going to be able to do that as well. So if he sends you a message, uh, don't be that weird person that pretends you didn't see it. Just answer it. He'll be able to set up a call, answer questions and all those great things. Now, let's go ahead and jump into things here. So this is called, what do I do if I have a 401k? All right. Now, this is all based on the premise that the 401k or the retirement plan as we know it is not actually a good idea. Okay. So if you missed last week, last week we focused on, is it really a smart idea to put money into a retirement account? Right. And, and we kind of looked at that and we, we basically broke down, you know, there's, there's different types of retirement accounts. A lot of people don't know this. They think they have a 401k at work and that's a good thing. Okay. And so we talked about how that doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing. There's something called a custodian and a trustee. And then there's also something called an investment company. And those are the three components of any retirement account. And so we kind of dove into, if I have a retirement account and I have an investment company that is also my custodian, meaning they're holding my funds. And they're also my trustee, meaning they built the legal document for my retirement account. They're kind of cherry picking. Okay. Cherry picking means that they, they're, they're locking me down in their account so that they can sell me their stuff. Right. So we kind of went over that last week and I'm going to sketch this out just briefly again tonight, um, just so we can all be on the same page with this again. But again, we have, you know, in a retirement account, So we have a retirement plan broken into three categories. The first category is the trustee. Second category is the custodian. Third category is the investment company, right? So the investment company. So we kind of broke down if your retirement plan is being built by an investment company, it really is just free hot dogs at Costco right? They're trying to get you into a free retirement plan free because they earn money on fees and they earn money on commissions once you're locked down and you can only pick their products. So we kind of came to the conclusion that that's not a good idea. Okay. We also talked about if I have a retirement plan and I'm not out of debt and I don't have reserves, that it's also not a good idea to be putting money into it. Right. I get questions from people all the time. Like, should I put my money into my 401k? Should I put my money into my IRA? Should I do this? Should I do that? If you're not in a financial position where it makes sense, then the answer is no, right? It's kind of like asking like, like, should I fill up my car with gas if it's already full and I haven't driven it? No, you don't need to. Or should I go buy gas if I don't have a car? No. Should I go buy dog food because it's on sale, but I don't have dogs? No. All of those things are in the wrong sequence. So putting money in a retirement account when I still have debt, consumer debt, you know, uh, car payments, credit cards, student loans, family and friends that I owe. Okay. Uh, tax debt, whatever it might be. I need to pay all of that stuff off first. Then I put money in a retirement account. I also need to have reserves in a retirement ca- account. I can't touch my money till I'm 60. So it'd be foolish of me to not have reserves first so that if something bad happens, I actually can access my money instead of just putting it all in a retirement account. And then I'm screwed if something does happen. Okay. So what we went over last week means that for 99% of us, we're probably in the wrong type of retirement account or we're in a retirement account when we should not be, which means it's not a good idea to keep doing it. So what I want to read to you tonight is a little bit from my book, again, How to Create Wealth. And I want to talk to you guys about what do we do if we have an account? Because that's the conclusion I come to. If I think, okay, I've got an account, I'm putting money into it, just learned it's maybe not a good idea. What should I do instead? Okay, so the first thing that you can do is you can halt your contributions. This is for anybody with any account. So if I have a retirement account, regardless of whether it is a 401k or an IRA or a 403b, these are all different names for retirement accounts. I can halt my contributions. I can stop putting money into it. Okay, I can stop putting money into it. Now, what's going to come up is, well, what about the match? Well, last week we addressed the match as well. Okay, the match is not a match. It's called deferred compensation. It's actually a 99, 99 cent on the dollar reduction in my pay to be able to get a free match from my employer. Not only that, but it's not free because I have to give up a dollar to get the free dollar and then I lose both of the dollars till I'm 60, at which point I'm going to pay more in taxes, more in fees, and inflation is going to reduce the value of it. So it's a lose lose scenario. So when I halt contributions, I don't care about the match. 
I don't care if it's 3% or 6% or 10%, 10% of a bad idea is 100% bad idea. It doesn't matter how much the match is. So we're halting contributions. That's the first thing we're going to do, right? So in my book, I say halt the contributions, even if they're matched. Fear of loss doesn't make something a good idea. Okay. So this, this is one that I want to hone in on because it can be very easy to get very like fixated on losing out on the match. Fear of loss does not make something a good idea. Sometimes we have to just cut our ties and say, Hey, this wasn't a good idea to begin with. It was a mistake to get involved with it. I'm going to cut my losses and stop repeating the mistake. Okay. I may or may not be able to get the rest of my money out of the retirement plan, but that doesn't mean that I should keep doing it because it's just going to cost me more in the long run. Okay. The second thing is if I can roll the plan over, this is called a rollover or direct transfer. Okay. So a rollover or direct transfer, what that means, and I'm going to draw this out. What a rollover or direct transfer means is it means I have, let's say a 401k. Okay. I've got my 401k here and it's either with an old employer that I no longer work for right? So it's either old. Actually, I'm going to make this even better. Either it's old or I'm old, right? So either it's old or I'm old. And what I mean by that is if I, this is an old plan from an employer that I don't work for, meaning that that 401k is old, I can roll it over. I can actually take a 401k or an IRA or a 403b or a pension or any type of retirement account out there. And if it's with an employer that I don't work for anymore, I can move it into my own account. Okay. When I move it into my own account, I'm taking control of the plan. So I'm actually able to start like managing what happens with this money and what I'm going to do with it. Okay. So that's, if it's old, I can do a rollover, right. Or a direct transfer. If I'm old, I can do something called an in-service rollover. Okay, an in-service rollover means that I'm age 59 and a half or older, and I'm still working for that employer, but because I'm of age, I can take my distributions and roll the plane over now, even though I still work there. Because the rules are with a retirement account, I can move that money at age 59 and a half. Okay, whether I work there or whether I don't, that's the rule of just the plan itself. So if I still happen to work there, I can still move that money. So that's called an in-service rollover. That's only if I'm the one that's old. Okay. It doesn't mean the plan's old. It means I'm old, right? So if that happens, I can do a rollover or a direct transfer. Now I want to kind of go through what this looks like. So if I'm going to be doing a rollover, that means that I have, again, we talked about, we have a trustee and a custodian. Usually they're one in the same, right? So I have these, this entity that holds my money, right? So my 401k or my retirement account is here. Once I do a transfer or a rollover, I can take the funds from here and I can move them into a new IRA. So I can do an IRA or I can do something called a qualified plan. These are both new retirement accounts that I've set up for myself and I can move this money into it and I can do that on a, on a tax deferred basis. Tax deferred means that normally if I pull money out of a retirement account, I'm going to pay taxes on it, Right. But if I'm pulling it out of a retirement account to put it into another retirement account, I don't pay taxes on that. Okay. So this question of like, okay, I've got this old account. What do I do with it? This is called a rollover or a direct transfer. I'm rolling the funds into a new one, or I'm transferring them into a new one. And it's going to be either a new IRA that I've set up, or it's going to be a qualified plan that I've set up right now. The qualified plan and the IRA are two different things of the same breed. IRA stands for individual retirement account. So that's going to be a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. It's an individual plan. A qualified plan would be like another 401k. So it's not individual. It's, it's an employer sponsored or a business sponsored plan, but I can set one up if I qualify and I can move it into that as well. Okay. Now the key here, if I do this, the key here is that this needs to be self-directed. Self-directed. If I don't self-direct this literally, it's the epitome of jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Okay. So if I move from a custodian based, let's say it's a 401k at my old employer where it's in mutual funds and all of the bad stuff that I mentioned last week is happening to this money. And then I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go set it up with Vanguard because they're cheap. Okay. I've just moved it from an, a custodian based plan to another custodian based plan. That's a bad idea. I move it from American funds or fidelity 
to Vanguard. Vanguard's going to do the same thing. They're going to lock me up in handcuffs and say, great, you're in our free account. You can only buy Vanguard stuff because we make fees on it. Sure, our fees are lower than everyone else's, but we still make fees on it and you can't invest in anything else. So you don't want to do that. You want to get rid of having a custodian that limits your options. So you would move it into a new IRA or a new qualified plan. You'd make sure it's self-directed. Okay. Self-directed means that you get to pick where the money goes. Okay. Self-directed means that you can choose any type of asset out there. Okay. Within this, there's two types of plans that will tell you they're self-directed, but in reality, only one of them is. Okay. So there's self-directed plan number one, which I'm going to draw out for you guys here, which is really not self-directed, right? So there are plans that will tell you, Hey, we can let you self-direct. And you're going to hear that and think, great. That's exactly what I want. I want to self-direct. They said that they can do it. What that means for them is you can buy any type of mutual fund you want. Okay. Remember we said a custodian is only going to let you buy their mutual fund. So Vanguard is not self-directed because they'll only let you buy Vanguard. Okay. But you might go to like, like, let's say your bank or T Rowe price or Edward Jones. And they're like, oh yeah, we're totally self-directed. You can buy any type of mutual fund you want. Okay, but you can't buy real estate. You can't buy gold and silver. You can't do private lending. So that's not actually self-directed. Okay, self-directed the way that we're talking about. This is real self-directing. Okay, you can do mutual funds if you want to. So if you want to be an mf -er, you can. Mutual funder. Get your mind out of the gutter. So if you want to be an mf -er, you can. Uh, if you want real estate, you can do real estate. Okay, you can do gold, you can do silver, you can do loans, right? You can buy businesses. These are all things you can do in a self-directed retirement account, okay? So if I'm looking to build wealth, regardless of retirement accounts, and I'm, I'm a Wealth Dynamics client or I'm watching this and my views line up with Wealth Dynamics, then you know mutual funds are a bad idea. I don't want to buy invisible shares of nothing that maybe will pay me, maybe won't, but guaranteed I'll pay fees, okay? So I don't wanna be an mf -er. I wanna buy real estate, I wanna buy gold, I wanna buy silver, I wanna do loans, I wanna buy businesses. Those are the types of things I wanna go into my retirement account with because these are real assets, okay? This entire wealth thing is about trading worthless digits and piece of pa pieces of paper for real things, Okay, it's not about trading worthless pieces of paper and worthless digits for other pieces of paper and other digits that just happen to have a higher price. Okay, so, so when I look at this, like I have to really look at, um, I have to really look, I'm just looking at the comments here. Nano, I think you're messaging everybody. Um, <laughs> Lexi, do you want to help Nano message people directly? So uh, Nano is just being a, uh, doing a good job of these messages, messaging everyone. So I'm seeing it all pop up. Um, so I want to take worthless dollars, pieces of paper. I want to trade them for gold. Gold is a real thing. Or I want to trade them for real estate. Real estate is a real thing. I want to trade them for businesses. Businesses are a real thing. That's actual wealth, right? But I don't want to take a worthless piece of paper called a dollar and trade it for a worthless piece of paper called a mutual fund or a stock certificate. That's also a nothing. We're not trading nothings for nothings. This, this is why I don't do Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin is a nothing. It's an invisible nothing. If it crashes, it's a glorified you know, computer file, right? But if I buy real estate, there's a house there. There's land there, right? There's tennis there. If I buy gold, I have a freaking brick of gold in my hand. If I buy silver, I have a silver coin in my hand. If I extend a loan to somebody and, 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 and everything goes to hell, I can foreclose and take whatever the collateral is. Right? That might be a house or a car or a business. If I have a business, I have a company, I have employees, I might have a building, I have products and services. Right? So it's not about deferring taxes to get the highest nest egg. It's not about that at all. It's about getting tax deductions and using that money now to buy real things. And you can only do this in a real self-directed account. Okay? So that's the, the thing we want to look at is rolling the plan over. Okay, now there's, again, only a couple circumstances that you can roll the plane over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this out again, right? So we can do rollover from an old plan, right? We can also do an in-service rollover, meaning that I'm over 59 and a half. I'm going to go ahead and put that 59 and a half or higher, right? 
Uh, the other one we can do is we can do, <clears throat> uh, we can do last year anyways, we could do this. We'll probably have another one this year, but you can do the equivalent of like a, a Corona related distribution or uh, a qualified disaster distribution, or I bet next month, another one will come out. But recently because of all the COVIDs, we've had uh, instances of you can take money out of the account, usually when you wouldn't be allowed to, but because if you qualify for whatever circumstance, you can pull that money out. Right, so those, these are these, these are, these are we're, we're gonna call these circumstantial. Okay, you can also do something called a hardship withdrawal. So this means if I'm, if I'm broke, let's say I have a bankruptcy or I'm swimming in debt or whatever it might be, I can pull money out of that and I'll still probably pay taxes and penalties, but it at least unlocks it, right? And then the other one we can do is called a 72T, okay? A 72T means if it's an old retirement account, I can take ongoing distributions. So I can, I can even out like an equal distribution every single year, I believe until I'm 70 and a half and I just pay taxes on the distribution. So that's another one that we can look at is if your employer allows you to do a 72T, a lot of them don't, some of them might, or if you have an old plan and you don't have the option to roll it over for some reason, that would be an option. Okay. So, so this is something we're looking at is a 72 T as an option as well. So these are all ways that we can move that money. Okay. These are forms of rollovers or distributions, right? So if I do a rollover, if I do an in-service transfer, if I do a Corona distribution or a qualified disaster distribution, what I would do is I would pull that money out and then move it into a self-directed account. That's a one, two thing. We're not going to move it into a another custodial account. We're not going to do anything else with it. And then the 72 T same thing. I could move that into my uh, qualified retirement plan, my IRA, whatever it might be. Okay. So these are things we can do with a retirement account in order to roll it. That's our first thing is if I stop contributing to it, I can roll it. Let's do that. Now, if I can't, then what do I do instead? Okay. Cause I have some people that are going to watch this and I'd be like, that's great. Um, I can't do a rollover. I'm not over 59 and a half. So I can't do an in-service distribution, right? Or I already took my Corona related distribution. So I can't have another one. Um, I, I'm not in a hardship, so my employer won't let me do that. And I can't do, you know, the, the 72 T either. So what are my options? Okay. So the other thing that you can do here is you can do a plan loan. Okay. If you have a 401 K or a 403 B. So these are, you can't do this with IRAs, right? So not IRAs. You cannot take loans against IRAs, everything but IRAs. So these have to be 401 Ks, 403 Bs. 401As, they allow plan loans. So a plan loan is going to say, I can typically borrow 50% of my plan balance. So I can take a loan of 50% of my plan balance up to 50,000. I think for Corona, they changed this to 100,000. And then I pay myself back over 60 months. And it's usually going to be at a 2 to 5% interest rate. Okay. So this is, this is another type of plan that we can take out a loan, right? So it's got to be again, a 401k, 403b, 401a, that type of thing. Right. And I'm going to borrow against the plan. I'm going to have to pay myself back over 60 months and I'm going to pay myself a two to 5% interest rate. This interest rate, I'm not paying to someone else. So I am paying this to myself. Okay. So I'm going to take the loan. And then basically what I'm looking at here is if I look at the AM schedule on this, let's say, let's say that my payment is $500 a month. Okay. So I take this loan out. I now have to pay 500 bucks a month back to my plan. My goal is to take that 50,000 and invest it in something that makes me more than $500 a month. Okay. So then at least I can make a, like a profit spread. So if I take 50,000 and I invest it at 12%, I'm going to make 500 bucks a month right? That's a break even. In my opinion, that's better than leaving the money in the plan, right? But I'm not making anything extra on that. So if I can make more than that, then yeah, I could do 500 bucks a month towards my plan to pay it back. And then if I can make six or 700, then I make a one or $200 a month profit spread. Okay. So this is called a plan loan, a 401k plan loan or a qualified plan plan loan is not taxable. Okay. There's no penalties to do it. You just have to follow the rules, right? So I can borrow against it. I can only do the maximum of 50% of my balance up to 50 grand. I've got to pay myself back over 60 months. I've got to pay myself the agreed upon interest rate and I cannot miss a payment, okay? Now, if I do this and I miss the payment, 
then the entire amount counts as a distribution and I'm going to pay taxes and an early withdrawal penalty on it. So if I do a plan loan, I have to really look at, am I doing this correctly? Okay. So this is something you can do as an option as well. Now, if you cannot do a plan loan, then you could just cash it out, right? So if I'm cashing it out, I'm looking at a couple of options, right? So if I do a cash out, first thing is, am I allowed to? Cash out means I'm going to take a distribution. I'm going to cash the 401k or the IRA out early. I'm going to pay taxes, right? And I'm going to pay a 10% penalty. So if I'm in a situation looking at this, let's say, let, and, and when I pay taxes, I'm going to pay the tax rate. So I'm going to pay the rate. Plus it's going to increase my income. So it's going to increase my AGI. That's called my adjusted gross income. So what I mean by that, watch, watch and listen very carefully here. If I'm making $100,000 a year, right? Let's say that puts me in the 20% tax bracket, okay? But then I take out a $50,000 distribution against my 401k, that $50,000 increases my taxable income that year by $50,000. So I'm going to pay taxes on the $50,000, but I'm also going to increase my tax bracket on all of my income. Because my adjusted gross income on my taxes now says 150 instead of 100. So if I don't plan for this, this is going to suck hard. Okay. So if I'm just like, oh, I'm going to take a distribution because Jerry said to on YouTube and, and I'm not going to talk to anybody and get any consult on this. Chances are you're going to pay probably, you know, like 15, 20% more on, on taxable income on all of your income, not just on the plan. People don't connect these dots. They're like, well, of course I'll pay the distribution taxes. Yeah, but also your income went up, so you're going to pay taxes on all of your income at an increased rate, plus a 10% penalty, right? So if I'm looking at this, I might be paying 30, 40, 50% between taxes and penalties for taking that money out early, right? So I have two options here. I can either out earn it, right? So if I look at this and I'm like, what's the lesser of the two evils? Leave the money with Wall Street till I'm 60, or pay 30, 40, or 50% now and at least have control over the leftovers. I might be looking at, I think I can out earn Wall Street. I could put this in real estate. I could put this in my business. I could do private lending, right? There's tons of things I could do with this, but I'm looking at, I'm going to out earn whatever I would get by the time I'm 60. So I've got to do that math. I've got to look at if I leave it here, what's it going to turn into if I leave it versus if I do something with it, what can I grow it to? Okay. So this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, can I out earn it or can I get a deduction? Right. A deduction means, let's say, again, I took out that 50 grand, pull out the $50,000 distribution, but then I immediately put it into something that's tax deductible and I write off 50,000 against it. Okay. If I do that, what happens is I don't owe the income tax. This now goes away. I still owe the 10% penalty, but check this out. If I do this, when I put the money in the plan, I got a deduction, right? Initially, when I put money in the 401k, I got a deduction. That deduction might've saved me 20 or 30 or 40%, depending on what my tax bracket was the year that I put that money in, okay? So I saved 30 or 40% on the front end. And then when I take the money out, I'm gonna only pay 10% on the back end. Okay, this is a brilliant idea. This is what I do with my accredited investors. When someone becomes a millionaire, there are in investments that they're allowed to do at that point that the rest of us don't get to know about until we become millionaires as well. They're called accredited investments. And a lot of those investments give us a tax deduction on the entire amount that we put into the plan. So if I pull 50 out of the account on my 401k and owe the taxes, but I take that 50 and I put it into one of these accredited deals, I get a $50,000 write-off immediately. So I don't have to pay any taxes and instead I just pay 10% and I save 30 or 40% probably on the front end. So I'm saving 30, 40, paying 10. That's arbitrage. I'm making a profit spread between the deduction that I got and what I paid on the back end. So if I do this correctly, this can be a very smart move, right? But if I do this incorrectly, then it's going to cost me a lot of money, right? Because if I don't have a way to put the money somewhere better, it's going to just be 30, 40% off the top. And if I'm not thinking ahead of time about how, to, how I'm going to out earn that rate, then I'm kind of just screwed. Okay. So that's another option. So we went over so far, halting contributions. Anyone should do that. It doesn't take any thought to halt your contributions. Um, if you can roll it over into a self-directed IRA, if you can't roll it over, can I borrow against it? Right. 
If I can't borrow it against it, can I cash it out? And if I can't do that, then I pretty much do have to just leave it there. Right. And if I leave it there, like I'm just really relying on at that point, the fact that hopefully I might leave at some point. And when I leave, I'll be able to take that money then. Okay. But there's nothing I can do with it between now and then they're not going to suddenly let me start self-directing my retirement account or any of those things. Now, my, this is, this is my speculation. It's not based on anything. My speculation is that the, the government is going to want you owning less and less things. So they're going to give you more and more ways to cash out your retirement account with hopes that you blow it on your bills, you know, beer and rent basically. Um, and so we're probably going to see more mandates like, like the Corona related distribution where they want people to liquidate the retirement account because they know they'll get the tax income and people will become more reliant on their stimmies. Okay. Stimmies are, are what I call the stimulus payments, right? Cause we're going to see more of those coming through. So that's not fact that's speculation. But if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would bet on the fact though, that that's probably going to be something we see where there might be another lucky strike on, you know, COVID round six comes around and people can pull out more money or disaster happens or whatever. And the government says, Hey, you can pull out more money from the retirement account. In addition to what you took on the COVID related distribution. Okay. So if that happens, great. Um, that's kind of the saving grace for maybe somebody that can't do anything. Right. Um, so those are the things that I would look at in, instead of the retirement account. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is what are my contributions going to look like instead? Right. Cause if I was contributing, let's say 3% into this account, where do I put that instead? Okay. So let's say I was doing a 3% match, meaning I was putting in 3% of my income and they were matching me 3% of my income out of my budget. That's 3%. So let's say I'm making a hundred grand a year, right? 3% of a hundred. What is that? That's $3,000 a year, right? So 3000, that's about 250 a month. So I'm putting 250 a month into my 401k and I watch Jerry's video and I'm like, man, I really shouldn't be putting money in a 401k. I'm going to stop. Now I have 250 bucks a month back in my budget. Okay. What do I do with that money instead? That's the conversation I want to have now, because if I don't do something with it, I'm probably going to blow it. Like just this, the, the I think it's called Parkinson's law. Like, like things, things expand the amount of room you give them. So if I give myself 250 bucks, my budget will expand by 250 bucks. That money will find somewhere to go. Okay. So this is, this is why I don't think the 401k in and of itself is a bad thing because I think a lot of people wouldn't have anything if they didn't have a 401k because people don't naturally save money. People don't naturally pay themselves first. So if it wasn't for having a 401k and a, merge, and, a, and, and a mortgage, yeah, most people would probably have nothing because they're, they're not going to put money aside. So there's something to be said for being on an automatic forced savings plan that makes me pay myself first. If that was a successful action and then I halt the 401k and then I don't mimic that successful action somewhere else with a similar thing, then my success is going to fall apart. Because if that's what my successful action was, I've now canceled it. I'm not doing it anymore. So I need to take this 250 if I halted that contribution and find somewhere else to put it, right? So where do I put it? This really is going to be dependent on where I'm at financially. So again, two questions you should ask. Is this a good idea for me? And is this a good idea for me right now, right? So if I've got 250 a month, I shouldn't just be like, oh, let me go buy Bitcoin or let me put it in an IRA or let me do an HSA or let me do gold and silver or let me do life insurance because they're good ideas. I need to look at is what is a good idea for me? Okay. Based on my position, what makes sense right now? So if I have debt, then I should probably only be putting this money into life insurance, right? So if I have debt, it's going to go into life insurance. We call this the sacred account. Okay. If I don't have reserves, then again, this is going to go into life insurance. Okay. If I'm out of debt and I do have reserves, then I could be doing things like asset accumulation, right? So if I'm doing asset accumulation, then I could be buying gold. I could be buying silver, right? These are actual like real assets that I started accumulating with. If I'm in investment mode, then that could be going into steel, gold, and silver, right? It could be going into real estate, could be going into private lending. At this point, it could be going into things that are going to give me tax savings, right? So I could be putting it into, you know, tax planning, IRAs, 401ks, whatever it might be. But this is the sequence that I would go in, 
right? So what, what is the right idea for me with this 250? If, if I'm in debt, the right idea for me is to put it towards something that's going to pay off my debt. Okay. But I don't want to be broke when I pay off the debt. So that's why I'd use the life insurance. Okay. If I have no debt, but I don't have six months of savings and reserves, then I'm not broke, but I'm insolvent. So I need to get solvent. And before I start trying to do any assets and investing, I need to just be solvent. I, I have, you know, reserves and all this stuff covered. So I would use life insurance for that too. Okay. But if I'm out of debt and I'm solvent, then I'm looking at, all right, well, how do I start buying assets? Okay. This is the fun part. This is the conversation that everyone wants to have. A lot of us are not there yet though. So this is where, is it right for me? And is, is it also right for me right now, right? This time. So if I start buying assets, I'm like, man, let me do gold and I got silver and I got real estate. I'm going to start doing some tax plays, but I've got debt and it's costing me 20% of my income. That doesn't make sense. I'm actually going backwards. Okay. I could take a hundred thousand dollars and put it in a real estate deal and earn 12%. And that's only going to pay me a thousand bucks a month. And if I'm, if I'm making a hundred thousand in income and my debt is 20% of that, that's 20 grand that goes towards my debt. So I could take that hundred grand and put that in a real estate deal and make a thousand bucks a month. Or I could take the hundred grand, pay it towards my debt and get basically $20,000 a year back. That's an $8,000 difference in surplus, right? So the debt is a smarter idea to pay off instead of doing the investing. Similarly, if I start going after all this stuff, you know, gold and silver and real estate, and I don't have reserves, this happened in 2020. People don't have reserves. All the money's in the retirement account. Then COVID happens, they lose the job. Why do you think the corona-related distribution became a thing? Because people didn't actually have money. So, so the government said, okay, great. Let them, let them crack open their retirement plans early and blow it all on, on mortgages and rent and groceries. That was not the intention of that money. I think it was great because I have a lot of clients that took advantage of that to self-direct their retirement plan. But I feel bad for the people that really did have to take all of their life savings and blow it on keeping up with their mortgage payments simply because they had no reserves. Okay. And the only two reasons that someone has no reserves is they just are not planning whatsoever with their finances. Like they're just completely irresponsible or they're justifying, well, if I put it in there, I can't invest it. And then I'm not going to make 12%. Well, you're not going to make 12% when you've got to cash out your retirement plan and pay off the mortgage with it. Right? Like, like that, that's also not a winning place. So have your debt covered, have your reserves covered. That's where this money would go to first. That's where it should have went to originally before we ever put it in a retirement account. Now that it's free, let's go back and do what we should have done in the first place. Right? If that's covered, then we start doing assets. We can start putting 250 a month towards gold, silver, whatever it might be. Okay. You can do monthly subscriptions of gold and silver. If you guys didn't know that, that's how I started. I didn't buy you know, a hundred grand of gold and silver the first day I bought like a thousand bucks worth. And I kept doing that over time. And then it built up. Sure. Now you see me posting that I buy kilos of gold and I drop 60 K on a kilo and in almost every week now. And it's like fun. That's awesome. But I didn't start there. So if I've got 250 bucks and I'm out of debt and I've got my life insurance funded and I've got my six months of reserves that can then start going towards getting me some gold and silver and buying real assets. If I've got enough accumulated here, then I can start getting into real estate. Uh, I can start getting into private lending. I can start putting money towards taxes, not towards taxes, towards reducing taxes. Sorry, that was, that was, that was, uh, uh, that's actually like a corporal sin to say putting money towards taxes or reducing taxes, right? So these are all the things that I should be doing instead with those contributions. So two things here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up a little bit early tonight because I want to answer questions and end on time. But two things that we covered, we covered if I have a plan, what do I do with the balance? The balance meaning what I've already put in, okay? Do I roll it over and self-direct it? Do I borrow against it, right? Do I take a loan against the plan? Do I do a distribution? Do I take a hardship? Do I do a 72T? These are all things that my team can help you answer. Okay, whether you're a client or not a client, like schedule a call with Nano, schedule a call with me, we'll jump on and talk to you about that, right? These are also not things that I would wing because the balance has the biggest liability. If I do the wrong thing with the balance, I might owe taxes, I might owe penalties, okay? So you can talk to, to, to someone that's done that before and they'll be like, yeah, like my, my, my family uh, in Alaska, there's a lot of slope workers, they work on the oil fields, Great guys, hardworking, but what happens is they work for a year or two, then they get laid off from that job and then they move into the next one. And every time they do that, they cash out their 401k. 
Every time they cash out the 401k, they pay taxes on it. Every time they cash it out, they pay penalties on it. And it just repeats over and over and over. Okay. Finances are not like it's math. It's simple. So if it feels like a broken cycle, it, not to be blunt, but to be blunt, it means that I'm doing the same stupid things over and over. If it feels like I'm in a repetitive cycle of negative with my finances, it means that this is the rule of money here. I violated it and then I kept violating it. And then I did it over and over and over and repeated it and repeated it. And that's why I keep getting the same results. And that's not a ding or a dish, a disc, because I might look all sophisticated. Like I know what I'm talking about, but let me tell you 10 years ago, I was a dumbass with money. Okay. I like, you tell me a financial stake you made. I can tell you one that I made that was worse. Right. But one of my point is here is that this is all simple stuff, but it does take some foresight and it does take some planning and it does take understanding what the rules are of these accounts so that we make the right decisions with them. Right. So thing one, if I put money in a plane, I stop and I stop, what does my balance look like right now? What do I do with that balance? Where do I put it? How do I roll it over? How do I minimize taxes? How do I minimize penalties? How do I maximize control? How do I maximize growth? Those are all things we're looking at. Thing number two, I used to contribute income into that plan. If I no longer do, what do I do with that income? Okay, based on where I'm at financially, that's gonna be where that income used to flow. Do I need to put that towards paying off debt with my life insurance? Do I need to put that towards gold and silver? Do I need to put that towards something different, right? All things that we'll discover and talk about, but it takes foresight and it takes planning. Okay. Now, as we're wrapping up here, if you guys are on zoom, what I want to do is have you drop your questions in the comments. So if you have a retirement account, uh, maybe you're wondering what your options are with it. Uh, if you have a retirement account that you recently stopped contributing to, and you're like, Hey, what can I do with the balance or with the, uh, the contributions now that I have the income back? That's another thing to talk about. Um, if you're thinking about putting money in a retirement account and you want to know, should I like, let's talk about that. So go ahead and drop your questions in the comments. Um, we'll answer those live on Zoom. If you guys are on Instagram and Facebook, I'm going to go ahead and answer your questions here now. All right. Good to see everybody here tonight on Facebook and Instagram. Good to see you guys. All right. Let's see what kind of questions we have here. <clears throat> Let's see here. No questions on Instagram so far. Let me scroll through here a little more quickly. Um, let's see here. John, good to see you. No questions yet. Someone asked, how do I legally take all of Adam Cullen's money? It's not a lot because he's a broke fool. I, <laughs> I don't know who Adam Cullen's is, but all right. Now you guys can see again, some of the stuff that I get on Instagram. Uh, so here's a question. What happens if you, have, if you have a pension, but you die with the pension? So if you have a pension, this is, this is kind of a gotcha. So a pension means that so it's called a defined benefit plan. A pension means that the company is going to guarantee a percentage of income off of, you know, whatever balance I have versus a 401k. There's no guarantee of anything. I just get the balance. A pension means I'm going to pay out an income stream. So if I have a pension and, 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 I, and I set it up, you know, initially, there's a couple of options on the payout. Okay. So there's a single payout, which means if I have a pension with a single payout and I'm the one that works there, when I die, my survivors get nothing. So I'm going to get more money per month when I'm living, but when I'm dying, it's gone, right? There's also a joint option, okay? So the joint option means when, my, when I die, it still keeps paying to my wife, right? <clears throat> Some of them have a survivor option, meaning if my wife and I die, I can go to the kids. But the thing is, is a lot of people don't understand that, right? So they think that I've got the pension, it's all good to go. They don't look at their beneficiary designations. And so accidentally, it can be on the single option when they're still married and they still have kids and grandkids and they die and their family loses that pension simply because they didn't look at who the beneficiary was. The second thing is the pension can go broke. Okay. I have a client in Hawaii. We looked at it there. The Hawaii pension is like tens of billions of dollars underfunded, meaning they're, they're taking out more money than the plan has. Right. So pensions are not something that I'm, I'm a, a fan of. If you have one and you can roll it over do that. 
Okay. Cause that's not what we address tonight. So if I have a pension, I can usually, if I'm not working there any longer, I can usually cash that plan out. Now they'll give me a payoff balance. So they'll say, based on what we were going to pay you an income, if you take it now, we'll just pay you a lump sum and you can roll it into a self-directed IRA. That way you can grow it faster than the company was going to. And you don't have the risk of them going broke with the plan or the beneficiary designation being incorrect. So very good question. I'm surprised how good of a question that was. That came from Instagram. Can you believe that? <laughs> Someone on Instagram has a pension. Um, all right, let me see what other questions we have. John asks, was the COVID extended? Uh, the COVID was extended for sure. The, th the COVID relief was not though, if that's what you're asking. Um, so the COVID relief distributions, uh, those are not extended. That did not get extended. They might have another similar thing this year. Like I think they're coming out with like another $1.3 trillion in stimulus in February, uh, which means our currency is going to go down in value even more. But I bet in that buried somewhere, we're probably going to see something similar to the COVID relief distributions. Um, okay, John added relief. He said, he said, was the COVID relief extended? The COVID was extended itself, but the relief was not. So that's all I see here on Instagram. So let me go ahead and sign out for them. And let's see what we have on Facebook instead. And then we'll hit our Zoom questions. All right, Facebook, good to see you guys. We have Arnold, good to see you. Steve, good to see you. Brad, good to see you. Josue, good to see you. Todd, good to see you. I don't see any questions on Facebook. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and jump on Zoom. I'm going to unplug my mic for a brief second and plug in my other one. There we go. I feel like a pilot when I wear these. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and we're going to answer our questions on Zoom. Um, my new mic is hooked up. So let me know real quick if you guys can hear this okay on the USB mic. All right, good. So I think everything sounds good there. So I'm going to go ahead and get my audio up and running on this. So if you have so a you question have a on Zoom, go ahead and drop it in the comments. What I'll do is I'm going to hop on live with you, answer your question, and uh, we'll talk together about the best solution for you. There you go, I had to make myself host again. Okay, so really quick, I'm gonna go ahead and look at our questions. Do we have some echo going on? All right, how is that now? All right, guys on Zoom, how is the sound? Is this is there an echo or things sound okay? Go ahead and drop in the comments if you guys hear any sort of echo. A bit better. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Good, Good now. now. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you Don. Don. Uh, okay, so it looks like Nano has a question. Let me go ahead and put Nano on live here. All right, Nano, you are live. Hey, Jerry, what's going on, man? I'm good. How are you doing, man? Doing great, man. Uh, thank you for asking, and thank you for uh, the great uh, session tonight again. Sorry, Sorry one, one more time? time? I said that thank you again for the, the great session that you did it tonight. For sure, man. Thank you. What's your question? So my, my question is, uh, what is the response to someone who says that they'd rather pay the debt faster? without using the life insurance because they're going to pay less money towards their debt due to saving an interest? Good question. 
So I would say to that person that they probably don't understand debt. Okay. okay. So, so, and this is not this to be mean, mean, but the person that's currently in debt, debt or getting into debt or struggling with debt as a byproduct doesn't understand debt. Okay. So the cause of debt is not debt. The cause of debt is lack of money. Okay. So the entire purpose of the sacred account is that if I take my income and I pay off the, dirt, the debt directly, yes, it's faster, but I don't solve the problem. The problem wasn't that I had debt. The problem was before I had debt, I didn't have money. Okay. So if I do okay, so all, I do of, all this of this and I get out lickety split, split super, super quick and I save, save a bunch of interest, but then I'm broke, broke I'm going to go, go back, back into debt. debt. And so that's the part that's being overlooked here. So the reason that someone would use the sacred account instead is they realize that number one, while they're paying off the debt, they don't want to have to go back in debt. So by funding a sacred account, I'm giving myself a cushion and I'm giving myself reserves. Those can build up intermittently because I'm going to eventually take loans against the plan and pay off my debt. But before I take a loan, I might build up a couple of grand. And if something happens, I've got a couple of grand right now. I don't have to go back in debt. Okay, I was on the Dave Ramsey plan forever and I was struggling with step number two because I didn't know how to stop going in debt while I was paying off the debt. Right. So that's going to solve that problem. That's thing one. Thing two is when I get out of debt, I'm going to have money set aside. So I'll pay off all of the debt and then I've got the balance of my sacred account now. So I'm never going to be in debt again. And then thing three is that entire balance grew like it never left the entire time it was there. Okay. So the person that's trying to pay off debt just for speed, you've heard the phrase, pick a fight with someone your own size. They're trying to pick a fight with someone that's not their size. They're trying to pick a fight with someone that's way bigger than them. And they think on paper, they'll get out quicker, but what's going to happen is life and they're going to end up staying in debt longer or never getting out. All right, let me see what other questions we have. Good question, Nana. Let me see what else we have here tonight. Avery says, great course. Thank you, Avery. Jen says, great course as well. Thank you, Jen. All right, Brad has a question. Let me go ahead and unmute Brad here. All right, Brad, you are live with us. How are you doing tonight? Good. How are you doing, Jay? I'm good. Thanks for asking. All right. So you have a question so have a on gold and silver? Yes, I do. I've been seeing these prices being held down, gold and silver, and uh, I've heard different things. And one of the, one of the uh, things I've heard is JP Morgan flooding, you know, with paper, you know, like ETFs or whatever they're doing to hold it down, not actual silver and gold. I'm just curious what you think, why it's being held down to prices. Excellent question. So let me go ahead and answer Brad's question. So Brad is saying that the price of gold and silver is lower than it should be. And I would agree. Okay. If you look at all the printing and everything that's been going on in this, this just 2020, we won't even talk about what's going to happen in 2021. Gold and silver should be a lot higher in price, right? Because when currency goes down in value, the price of gold and silver usually will go up in correlation with that. And so we're kind of seeing that did happen. Right. Gold had like a 40 percent return in 2020. So it did happen, but we were all expecting it to happen at an even higher degree. So a couple of things are going on there. So the first thing is in March of 2020, if you watched what happened with silver, silver went from like twelve dollars or from like twenty dollars an ounce down to like twelve. Right. I'm a silver dealer. Nowhere on the market could you actually buy silver for twelve dollars. OK, what happened was the paper price dropped. But the actual premium of like a real bar of silver was still like 20 to $22 an ounce. So we saw a separation, which is good. It's a true thing, a separation between the paper price of the asset and the real value of the asset to where when you went into a bullion shop and tried to buy it, you were going to pay a lot more than spot price. So there was really, like Brad said, there's a paper version of gold. There's a paper version of silver, whether that be stocks or bonds or ETFs or whatever your funds might be that are in gold and silver. But that's not the hard value asset. Now, the other thing too is in 2020, we got a lot of speculators into the gold and silver market. So the market comes up, the speculators are not long-term gold and silver investors. So they're pulling out to get their profits. That does drive the price down. And so those of us that are long-term holders and buyers of it, like myself, um, we might see our prices come down because kind of the amateurs are getting out of the market to grab their profits. 
The other thing we're looking at too is we have a lot of people that are abandoning gold and silver to get into Bitcoin. I think long term it's going to be a terrible mistake for them. I love it. I'll take the cheap silver and the cheap gold right now while they go to get into Bitcoin. Um, but we have a lot of people exiting the market, getting into that as well. There was some rigging of the gold market by JP Morgan. So if you do some research on that, Brad, you are right. JP Morgan did get fined. I think it was a billion dollars by the SEC for rigging in the gold market this year. So there was some manipulation there. Um, but overall, there's also some other contributing factors with it. So good question from Brad here. Let's see, we've got one from Avery. Let me go ahead and bring Avery on. All right, Avery, you are live. How are you tonight? Jerry, what's going on, my man? I'm good. Thanks for asking. What's your question? Yeah, I was going to ask, once you're an individual who's completely out of debt and you have solvency with your reserves, and now it's time to get into hard assets, gold and silver, what's a typical percentage of allocation to hold in those precious metals? Is it lifestyle dependent or is there a certain percentage that the individual is aiming for? Good question. So Avery is asking about what kind of allocation to use for gold and silver. Um, so there's a couple of schools of thought there. Um, now, if I'm using income, like I'm saving into it, and for someone that just got out of debt and they have reserves, that probably is the case. They've got income and every month they're going to be buying some. Um, overall, the goal is to save 40% of my income. Right? So if I take a pie and that pie is 40%, of that 40%, I can usually put 15 to 25% of it in life insurance. So right off the top, tops, we're going to put 25% in there. So I've got about 15% so left. Percent left. So I could put so I the could other 15, put the 15 in gold and silver. And, silver. and then and I just I have, have, you know, 25% of my income going, going, going to life insurance, 15% of it going to gold and silver. At a certain point, if I'm saving enough dollars per month, I'm going to max out that life insurance and I could increase my gold and silver allocation. So that might speed up a little bit as well. And then the other thing is, what is what is your net worth goal with it? So some people, you know, they, they want to have a percentage of their net worth in it. They might have five or 10 or 15 percent. Um, so that's another factor is if you're looking at percentage of net worth. If I'm being honest with you, what I do, I don't really go off of percentage of income or percentage of net worth. I max out my sacred accounts first. Once those are maxed, then I do gold and silver. And every time I do a real estate deal, I borrow against my gold and silver, right? So I'm not really focusing on a percentage of net worth. I'm really just buying as much as I can buy. Um, and and um, who and, I'm mimicking on, on this is actually, this is actually the, United the United States, States Federal, Federal Reserve, Reserve, our central, our central bank. bank. They're the, the number, number one, one owner and the number one buyer of gold, right? They control everybody. So I'm looking at them and I'm saying, okay, if they're the num number one owner and number one buyer, if I'm mimicking successful actions, then I want to be buying lots of gold and silver as well. So that's kind of how I go about it. Um, it's not really based on my income. It's not really based on my net worth. It's more based on once I've maxed out my other avenue, which is my sacred account with my life insurance, then I'm going to be putting money in gold and silver with 100% of my income allocated towards saving on that 40% after that. So the entire pie, basically. So that's kind of what I'm doing there. So good, so good question, question Avery. Avery. Let's, Let's see what else, else we, we have, have here. here. All right, we, we have, have a question, question from Derek, Derek here. here. All right, All right let, let me go ahead and unmute Derek. We'll answer his question. Is about uh, buying businesses with a self-directed IRA. All right, Derek, All right, you Derek, are live. You How, are live? How are you doing tonight? I think we, like still, we still have, have Derek, Derek on mute here. here. All right, Derek All right, must Derek be having must some, be mic, some problems. mic problems. So what I'll do so is I'll just, I'll just answer Derek's, Derek's question, question uh, just, normally just normally here. here. So, Derek so Derek says, says you keep, keep mentioning, mentioning that you can, that you can buy, buy a business with your self-directed account. account. Oh, oh, Derek, is that you? Yeah, this is his wife, actually. Okay, awesome. Who am I speaking with? This is Shirley. Shirley, Shirley, good to, good meet, to you. meet you. Good to so meet do you have Derek's, Derek's question, question handy? handy? Yes, I do. Okay, okay cool. cool. So, so what, what was Derek's, Derek's question? question? It was about um, buying businesses in a self-directed uh, IRA account. 
Uh, the question is whether you could buy a pit. Is it the same as buying a business or is it just these are two separate um, transactions? Yeah, yeah so, so what, what do you mean by, by pits? pits? Uh, private investment transactions. Okay, so, so to clarify on that, basically with your self-directed account, you cannot self-deal, right? So self-dealing means that I'm going to buy something that I receive current benefit from. So if I buy my business, let's say that Jerry sets up a self-directed IRA and then invests in Wealth Dynamics, that would be considered a for forbidden transaction or prohibited transaction because I'm double dipping. I'm getting the tax benefit and also investing in something that I own. So if that's what you mean by private by investment private transaction, transaction, that cannot, that happen. cannot happen. Now I can, now, I can buy, buy an, an uninvolved business. business. Right. right so, so if it's, it's not, not someone, someone I'm related to, it's not like an interested party, then I could invest in their business. I can start up a business. There's other business I can do, but I can't like self deal and do stuff between myself and my IRA as a private transaction. Um, so anytime, so anytime I do a property, I do a, property a, business, a business, if I buy gold, if I buy gold silver, silver, et cetera, et cetera. none of that none can of happen, that can happen with, with me buying me stuff buying from stuff myself, from myself, myself, myself with that IRA. With that IRA. Very good, Very good question. question. Those, those are, those are those the kind of things, things with self-directing. Self it's a, it's great, a great thing, thing but, it, but also it also can be uh, a, lot a lot of trouble that people unknowingly might get into just because they, they don't know exactly you know, know, the rules associated. associated. It's, it's great, great to have, to have someone, someone like our company stepping in as your custodian. And you know, we'll let you invest in self-direct, but we'll also keep you compliant with the rules. Okay, we've got a question here from... Looks like Nano. So he says, if I'm doing a deal and I got life insurance maxed out and gold, where do I borrow from? Okay, so Nano says if he's doing a deal and he's maxed out both his life insurance and his gold, what is he? where does he borrow from? So good question. Now you can't really max out gold, right? You can buy as much gold as you want to. So if you, if you have your life insurance maxed out and you have gold and you max that out, you could just go buy more gold. So that's what I would typically do is just go buy more. You can always pay your loans down and reborrow again. So, right, if you max out the life insurance, you can always pay off that life insurance loan and do another one. If you max out the gold, you can always pay off that gold loan and do another one. Um, if you have a primary residence and you have a first lien home equity line of credit, you could utilize that as well. So that's kind of the third leg is we can use a line of credit on the house and borrow from that as well. And that... It acts similar. It's not the same as life insurance, but it mimics it very similarly. Okay, good. I think that's all I see here on Zoom. Let me see if there's any more questions here. All right, I see, right, a, couple I see a couple on, 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 uh, on uh, Facebook, Facebook here. here. So Kevin, so Kevin Grant, Grant has a good, has question. A good question. He says, he can, says you can you explain what a, what a universal, universal life insurance, insurance policy, policy is? is. Good. So, so a universal, universal life insurance, insurance policy is, is a, a it's a life it's insurance, a life policy, insurance that policy that has a savings, a savings component, component and it has an, an, has an insurance, insurance component, component, right? Right. So, so similar, similar to whole life, whole life insurance, insurance, I can put money towards insurance costs, costs or I can put money towards cash value. value. Now, now with, with universal life insurance, what makes it different from whole life insurance is the insurance component goes up in cost every single year. It's called annually renewable, renewable term, term, right? So every right? time so I have a birthday, have a my, birthday premiums my premiums go up. This is why I don't, like, why it, I don't right? like it, right? So, so my, costs my costs increase every single year. year. That, actually that actually can come out of my cash value, value and, and it can, can reduce my performance. performance. When, when I get older, my costs on that policy renewal can become so high that it actually causes the policy to lapse. Most universal life policies, if you look at a real guaranteed illustration, they lapse when you're in your 70s, meaning that the 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 cost of that increasing premium was so great that it liquidated your entire cash value and you now have, you a, now 2, have a 2000 or 3000 or even more, more per month premium that you owe to the insurance company that you're, that you're probably, probably not going to be able to afford and aren't going to want to because you have, have no cash value anymore, anymore and then you just lose, lose the entire policy. policy. So, so that, that happens, happens very regularly, regularly with universal life insurance policies. policies. Um, the, um, the other difference between universal life and whole life, universal life has a guaranteed floor of zero. Right? right, meaning it can, it can never, never go, go below, below zero. zero. Whole, Whole life has, has a guaranteed, guaranteed floor of four. four. So I'm so never going to make less than a 4% gross dividend, right? right? Both, Both of them has, have fees. So, so Whole life, I might have a 4% dividend and 2% fees and I make 2%. Percent. Universal so life, I have a floor of zero and 2 or 3% in fees. And so I still would lose 3%. 
right? Zero minus three is negative three. So even if I didn't lose money on the money investment, I'm still going to lose money via the fees. fees. So, so there's a lot there's there, a Kevin. Lot I've got there, some Kevin, information I could send you on that, you on that. Um, um, via private, private message. You can study it, but that's in a nutshell. I don't own Universal Life. I don't sell Universal Life. I wouldn't sell it to a person I hated most in the world because I just don't think it's a good product. And I can give you some data on why because there's a lot of hype and confusion about it, but there are also some resources you can check out. Uh, Jose, uh, Jose has, has a question. question. So Jose, Jose says, says just, just to be clear, number one, max out the sacred the account. account. Tracking, Tracking, yes. yes. Number two, number two invest, invest the rest in gold, gold and silver. silver. That, is that is correct, yes. yes. Number, number three, three. Invest, invest into income-producing income assets, assets using sacred using account, account and metals. metals. That is that correct is also. also. Yep. yep. So Jose, so Jose you're on track with that. Um and of course, and of 40% course, percent savings, savings rate is a must. Yeah, and if you can go yeah, higher, go higher. higher. Like nobody, nobody says you can't do more than 40. That's, that's just what the 1%, 1 did. did. If you want to do 60 or 80, more power, more power to you. you. You'll, you'll get, get done faster. faster. Like you will you know, you'll be financially free sooner because you save a greater rate of your income to invest. Kevin says, good to know. Awesome. Let's see if we have any other questions on Zoom before we wrap things up here tonight. All right, Nano's right, asking, asking uh, kind of follow-up uh, follow on, on his question. So he said if he, he maxed out his, out his life insurance, insurance and maxed out his gold, gold what should he do? And I mentioned that he could do a HELOC. So he's, he's asking now, which one would it be more fitting to borrow from? Gold, life insurance, or HELOC? Does it matter? Um, so there are differences on each of those. Life insurance is the safest. So if I'm a new investor, I'm going to do more borrowing from life insurance because life insurance can only make money and it can never lose money. Right. So if I borrow money from something that can't lose and can only make to then invest in real estate where it's it's probably going to make, but it could also lose. There's no guarantees with real estate. I've got one degree of safety on my life insurance. I know at least that can go down right now with gold. Gold as an asset is never going to go down in value as an asset, meaning an ounce of gold will never be worth less than an ounce of gold. Now, the price of gold could go down, could go down. Right. So if I have a right, hundred thousand worth of gold. Worth of gold I borrow, I borrow against, against it into real estate, estate and, then and then the price of gold drops, drops to where I only have 70,000. I have lost paper value on that gold. So there is some risk there, right? So I would be comfortable with that when I'm comfortable with it. I wouldn't rush into that if I'm not ready yet. Okay. Similar with a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. That one's the most strict because you're dealing with large banks, right? The clients of mine that have HELOCs, I can attest how long it takes to get one. The approval process is insane. It got even worse during the COVID, right? So if I've got a HELOC, that's something that I'm going to borrow from, but I'm going to make sure that it's a very safe and very easy investment that I'm putting into it so that I don't ever risk losing the house. So, so it, it does, does matter, matter from, from the degree, degree of what's, what's my knowledge. And again, again those two, two questions, questions, is it right for me? And is it right right now? now. Right? right? So, so that would be my, that answer, would be my there. answer there. Uh, Don, uh, Don says, says always, always great, information. great information. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. 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 All right. So, so I, think I think that's all of our questions. Good. good. That's everything. That's so guys, I'm going to log out for tonight. Thank you all for watching. I think I see one more question. Nope, nope, answered answer that. that. Cool. cool. So, so um, um, thank you all for watching. Tune in again next Friday. Friday. And, if and if you guys have, have questions, questions that you would like me to cover in future, future weeks, you can shoot, shoot me a message or an email. email. Again, again, if you, if did, you not did not get a copy of my book, How to Create Wealth, wealth you, can you can do that. You can go to jerryfetta.com. You can get a free copy of my book. You cover the shipping. We'll give you the book for free. It's like eight bucks. Okay. And then you can follow along. We'll be in this book again next week. But send me what you guys would like to like to have me cover for future weeks because we are going to be moving on to a new segment once. We finished finish the, the book, and I want to make sure that we sure cover what you guys would like to have covered. So, so have a great weekend. Thank you all again. I will see you next time. time.